Dear Tony, too bad you died. I'm glad we had a chance to talk about that integration last February, but there was a lot more to say, and then you were gone. I introduced myself by awkwardly citing that quote of yours about how old ideas acquire new valences when relayed back into actuality, almost as if they had an agency of their own. I especially wanted to run an emblem by you, Egregoris the Culturalis, by an early 17th century alchemist named Mercurius Scura. On seeing it, your revisionist history flooded into consciousness in its reinitializing of the singular work of the theater of eternal music as a parasite on its original unfolding whose primary evidence is still ridiculously suppressed. But inevitably developing otherwise, given the 30-year time differential and the intervening awesome influence of its maiden voyage on us all, it was part chronoportation and speculative extrapolation of what might have been if the outfit had not ceased operations, an admirably called task. What if my grads located this compelling image in the British Library, lodged in a compendium of diagrams by contemporaries Flood, Mayer, and other esoteric luminaries? <laughs> that the central figure is the Mobius Strip, two centuries before its discovery, is disconcerting. But then again, wasn't it you who told me that John had retro-deposited one of his collaborations with Riley, the Ides of March, into the studio where the Fox's Mockingbird was about to be recorded eight years earlier, before bringing it to you? <laughs> the pounded out dominant seven was unmistakable. <laughs> you suggested that music is a handmaiden of control and its function as regulator of social relations through affective means, uninterrupted brainwashing, Dixit Marchetti, which by the same token makes it an ideal vehicle for productive reversals, confusions, and inscrutable extensions. If music and sonic processes at large act as binding forces, structuring programs, and trainment devices attuned to basic biological injunctions and vital processes, look at how musical activity channels and suppresses the escape vectors of theoretic creativity. Then it's open season. Capitalist tethered techniques have become so efficient in their harnessing of everyday life that exploits are required to split incalculable remainders from the signals captured by the transparency fascists. After obsessing on that image, a succession of fugitive hallucinations, quick and dirty heuristics, exploiting particular parametric decorrelations, conditions of possibility for perception, came upon me. These hacks weren't concerned with rendering opaque phonotechnical processes legible, naively transparent, but drawing useful effects from their very inscrutability, keeping proceedings at an infralegible remove, intractable to immediate conscious appropriation. I thought about these flashes pathologically in the way that local brain alterations propel re reorganization of the phononeurological system. The auditory scene is built up more deliberately than other systems. Integration doesn't happen by itself. The wayward efforts of plasticity and the heretofore suppressed powers emancipated in the process are basically incalculable. So you have to ping the network more or less randomly like our cyberneticist friends Ashby and Walter Fatland. Creativity isn't born out of reasoning. It's a game in which you have to set traps. The situationists knew the score, attending to the material concretizations of spectacle, objectified by the finitudes of technics. Lord Chando's lamentation on the inadequacies of language to fully render the world in itself is our opportunity. Fuck ontology. Reality is simply something that you handle, an intelligence operator once put it. It's more productive to parasite on the fictions that structure life and its particularities. If to not be evil means obliterating ambiguity, troubling asymmetries, opaque zones of non-knowledge, in short, facilitating the ascendancy of integral reality, well then, these are evil inclinations are. Vectors that elude human control. Because you're haplessly bound to your time, something will always escape. Evil is a form that understands us rather than the other way around, lying in wait on the sidelines, just like the opacity of a work of art that figures us out instead of us it. Wait, did you anticipate triple O too? <laughs> the coyote will loose us, stalking system bifurcations with a catastrophe mind. I always thought Lucier's I'm sitting in a room was a political intervention, an excitational maneuver surfacing the frequential biases of a given room which subtly modulate the activities that take place in it, but which themselves remain occulted. <laughs> <laughs> Background operations spring into operative consciousness. Nowadays, computationally sophisticated auditory dispositif are tripping over each other to suppress the acoustic particularities of a given scene in the name of privileging certain continuities rather than others. The heroin earbuds enable selective, environmentally responsive control of the auditory scene by amplifying and attenuating specific frequencies 
rebalancing the signal-to-noise ratio to cater to your listening and attentional proclivities. Schaeffer would have appreciated the way they mechanically execute his preemptive parsing of the world of sound into objects worth paying attention to, and those retreating into murky indistinction. Doppler calls that self-fulfilling loopiness active listening, as if listening wasn't always actively configuring the world. You nailed that early on with string loop. The outfit is aptly named, though, as the Doppler effect itself in its structuring of correlations between frequency and distance underlines the fatal elusiveness of any original vibrational signal in the received percept. True play, these brand names, maps the acoustic disposition of a room in the name of preserving the perfect sound clarity of a recording broadcast over speakers, made in variance, impermeable to administrations of spatial contingency. Disappearing the apparatic gaps which throw signal to frequential panic the second venue alienation problem, to optimize a seamless integration of control modulation. Suppress alienation, dissident thought goes down with it. It's a counterpart to the maximizing of signal by ever increasingly oppressive limiters, the loudness war, that guarantees a message will carry willy-nilly. But I'm not that worried. All these procedures only exponentially multiply capacities for new unintelligible vectors, glitch spaces of non-compliance. When you see Marianne, please tell her that her house size installations that denaturalize music by scattering its components filtered through all kinds of materials have inspired multiple disorientational experiments. Music in extreme conditions, if you will, resizing rooms on the fly through sliding mutations of reverb times and frequential esotericisms, undergirded by subtle wireless technological relays fractally diffusing a source, significantly disturbing the auditory system's ability to nail down the identity of a sound by its conforming to a unitary point of origin. Controlling echoic movement is no longer a big deal. Spatial alterations and affordance confusions effectively pressured subjects' affective and cognitive capacities without them knowing. You know when you enter a room how you can pre-consciously gauge how sound will travel, preemptively constraining possibilities for thought and action? Hijacking this innate capacity enables the most subtle form of control. It's gaslighting if you take it far enough. Asher exploited something like this by progressively dampening a room across its expanse, mobiozoidally modifying the apperception of volume, itself remaining objectively invariant. A phonomagus she was, subjecting herself to disorientational modes that persisted months after leaving an installation, her perception residually skewed. A DARPA guy once spent four consecutive days in an augmented Victorian house, her first experiment, and emerged with the transient ability to make strange correlations between discrete acoustic occurrences. Someone said he was sniffing out information on autoacoustic emissions, which DARPA later developed into a viable biometric marker. True. But being a disciple of Licklider, psychoacoustic maven, erstwhile DARPA man, an ARPANET inventor, something akin to man-computer symbiosis and the modeling of human acoustic behavior was probably nearer the mark. Conditions have consequences, Lick liked to say, not to mention that his work led directly to digital audio compression and auto-tuning. But basically, if the laws of acoustics can be violated so as to hermetically contain leaky sound through the right combination of surrounding speaker activity, there's no limit yet foreseeable to auditory control. Soft disorientation. Umwelt, umwelt restructuring is all the rage now. Those consumer apps tether cutting edge techniques to securitarian narcissism, whereas Slick's crew really took them into inhuman territory. Anyway, that shit's expensive. <laughs> You remember the grill in the room experiment? I tried a sonic analog with my students using Michael Snow's Sino Poda, except that instead of drawing attention away from the transitory ape on the basketball court, camouflaging it by requiring participants to count the number of passes, the tail of a perfectly legitimate ethnographic inquiry into the ritual musics of near extinct cultures steered my listeners away from the Whitney Houston in the room, she whose melody this so-called tribal culture was intoning. The essence of obfuscation is in getting things to be overlooked. Pure steganophony. Being so consumed by a task that something in plain hearing is not converted into a perception. Unlike most appropriate gestures that gain critical effectiveness through a double movement, whereby the material's origin and new destination are placed in tension, here the trajectory is collapsed into imminence. Whitney is made unintelligible, indiscernible, not through cathartic dialectic, but by mood priming towards a bygone era far from 1986. The belatedness of my students made little difference. My buddies were teens when it came out missed it too. Institue ad fictionem contrarium. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Anos of Nosia, unknown unknowns. The semiotic retuning of surface components granted the impression of an authentic Lomax-like reconnaissance mission. And it provides object lessons in percept construction through its exploitation of spandrels, 
the byproducts of reproduction that further vectorize the illusion, the sound of the material substrate, the simulation of an on-the-fly lo-fi setup, presentational formalisms that preemptively charge the signal, so many insidious techniques for simulation now empirically verified. The hoax fostered effects that metastasize beyond their local target of benefit to both control and resistance alike, who now had aversion methods at their disposal. Do you know that narrative design is one of the major components of operational neuroscience? Stories that snowball into realities. The brain and ear form a two-way system, each caught up in the other. The output of the cochlea itself is modified. Control du sensible, control du pouvoir. <laughs> to your infinite credit, even as the psychoacoustically compelling nature of your drone constructions yielded manifold returns that would satisfy most phonomagi, you never jettisoned semiotic navigation as an indispensable interventional agent. You always had an eye and an ear for the politics of aesthetics. Even with the flicker, you wanted people to lose themselves and to understand that they lost themselves in that world. But the kind of critical self-reflexivity you later engaged in has been suffering such tremendous assaults at the hands of hyperintensive equivocation for quite some time that I've been compelled to double down on the technical undersides that most often elude attention. Digression. The nine members of Ornette's prime time entered the stage one by one, slowly building up a contrapuntal chaos that provided no inroads for intuitive orientation until Ornette appeared, capping off the accumulation with his centripetal charisma and, especially, a strategically piercing melody, instantly pulling the other voices into intelligibility, though nothing about their performance had changed. It's about realignment, the brain tuning the cochlea. Snow, with a narrative abetting the work already initiated by material affordances. Ornette, with a particular paradolic knack for melodic keys that re-encode noisy distributions in a pinch. <laughs> you were always attuned to sound's capacities to selfly reorient, realign vision under the hood. Well, cementographer on Citizen Kane called sound the aperture because it could draw out specific components in an image, as would judicious focusing and depth of field alteration, but without flagging itself as agent. You know that true project I showed you on my phone, the Detorn commercials whose image and soundtrack delinking produce such weird effects? It's true, standard formalisms already guarantee a certain amount of sync and chuckles. But it's the moments that refuse to align that remain as something more occult, unintelligible. Unlike those AI-generated sounds that synesthetically merge with the visual object in a multisensorial conspiracy, these misalignments blatantly set incompatibilities in relief. The sound image compact is unexpectedly fragile and easy to derail. And yet, for all that, the desire to cement interpretation continues in irrepressible disposition, both poison and cure. Last year, 3,000 foreign students came to live with American families for a year through a program called AFS. This is the day they say goodbye. Post an AFS high school student. We provide the students. You provide the love. <laughs> call toll free. That's a hoot. But it gets even more interesting when technical operations are thoroughly suppressed from conscious attention. Other forms of becoming unintelligible come online. One of the truth's many unrealized proposals involved an infinite looping of the dedu deduction scene from all the president's men in which Redward and Hofstein feverishly grapple at establishing the identities of Watergate co-conspirators. The conceit was to infraperceptibly distend and compress their speech rates so as to modify the synaptic speed of arriving insights to make them sound more or less intelligent, but without altering pitch. This was the early 80s. Remember what a nightmare it was to undo the fatal compact between speed and frequency? I just learned that I Love Lucy reruns were sped up in the 70s to liberate more commercial time. <laughs> America would have noticed if Lucy's voice had been even slightly pitched up, so ingrained it had become over decades of exposure, so engineers managed to find a cumbersome analog solution. It turns out we're more attuned to pitch changes than speed alterations. Computational acceleration eventually took care of the problem, such that you could decorrelate and treat frequency and speed independently. Techno-ablation. By occulting technical procedures too recent to be intelligible as possible transformations, or conversely exploiting functions so intrinsic to everyday usage their tractability is ducked into the background, you could repattern any scene's effective and cognitive affordances, its moods, with the viewer none the wiser. You learn to surf the murky boundaries around the just noticeable differences that make a difference. None of the circa hundred edits in each sequence are perceptible as such. Some might raise suspicion, but they don't break continuity. Illusions don't gel with unnecessary expenditures of energy. You have to work from a model of the technical ecologies that prevail at the time to render transformations infralegible to the viewer. Yeah. Order, it could be 
Wait a minute. There was a guy once. As Machiavelli knew, one's efforts can flourish one day and come to grief the next. You're helped too by the fact that media are typically absolved with specific qualities of their own in the first place. Behind every real object resides a dreamt object, and as you know, these dreams can be sometimes actualized. The historical contingencies that render a past trope permeable to revalencing ops are always partly technological, sensitive dependence on initial conditions. The truth conceit was to loot the same scene, but always with different stretches and collapses to engender a form of anti-cumulative accumulation, where eventually you no longer know what the optimal or even original version is. You have no real mnemonic basis for comparison. You begin to develop different hypotheses. You'll appreciate the analogy with the flicker, given your fondness for ratios, ratio to the finish line, and the way it slides from pre-conscious autonomic mobilization to the conscious appropriation of patterns and back again, at the mobiozoidal rates along which those states shade into each other. You can track the waxing and waning of intelligibility. The speed thresholds above or below which the illusion falls apart, surfacing techniques, will change over time as the viewer becomes habituated to a given set of infralegible variations. People are becoming wiser now. All to say that the scene's dynamics in your take on the character's cognitive capacities depend not only on what is said, but by the secretive pressures exerted on it by fluctuating speeds. Intelligibility or its withdrawal is also contingent on how local particularities inflect and disturb more holistic perspectives, complicating any attempt at conceptual containment. I sped the same film up, compressing 120 minutes into five, all visuals integrally maintained. However, each accelerated scene was subtended by three layers of sound fragments that belonged to it, but playing at the original speed. An image sped up 24 times weirdly aligns with unaltered sound. It's a paradoxical sync that flattens discrepancies between macro and micro scales. The two types of unintelligibility, image too fast to be narratively grasped, sound too dense to be properly made out, together collapse into an almost intelligible story. Too bad you missed the Clinton-Trump face-offs. It took me back to another experiment with one of the notorious televised debates between Vidal and Buckley during the 68 convention. I worked out an algorithm that cut image and sound out of fluctuating rates with gaps of various duration. I hadn't expected this simple alteration would foreground the respective rhetorical styles of the two protagonists. Buckley's flowery digressing could suffer blackouts without his intelligibility fatally impaired, while Vidal's comparatively factual terse speech could barely be reconstructed. And the kind of infilling modes that such dropouts impel from the viewer are worthy of concerted attention. Not to mention what happens when linear language is so ventilated, impeding continuity. Code words that would normally have been dissimulated in the flow now pop out, their incipients co-produced by technical malfunction. Your experiments testing an error of leg legibility of scenes edited together by cutting back and forth between them at a flicker rate of speed taught me, again, how the technical and the semiotic can be leveraged against each other, sometimes at a politically deleterious price. <laughs> Bryant Park moratorium rally still blows me away. And it's attending to the palpable gap between an event and its simultaneous capture by the media, opening onto still further productive possibilities of decorrelating macro and micro scales. We will not feel, nor will we stand silently by while South Vietnamese people are persecuted by our government. Those you are pleased with yourself on discovering that the live televised coverage of the demonstration arrived temporarily before the actual event taking place 10 blocks from your hat, and more intelligibly to boot. It was Adorno's Mike Nightingale reversing causality. It foretold a time when events and their coverage would become indiscernibly collapsed together. Usually that's a bad thing. You missed a curious glitch during the Democratic love-in last July. A modest gaggle of Sanders supporters, heckling Warren for having betrayed them, re received such inordinate media attention that viewers believe a significant challenge would be mounted. This vocal but local dissent had a comparably negligible effect on delegates at the actual physical site. I grew up in Oklahoma. My daddy ended up as a maintenance man. What if you exacerbated this principle by amping up insignificant and contradictory local details of an event through an overwhelming amount of sources to render the whole unmappable, uncapturable, fractalizing the scene into vacuoles of noise, incommensurable latencies, flat ontologies, scalar confusions, gestalts that don't gestalt? Scrambling the codes to see what else assembles in its place, a dark media situation. The kind of potent obfuscation Marianne was working through her rooms. In those ecstatic, excessive moments, you can learn to listen away from sources, 
contingently, ma contingently making and severing connections between them, attending to the entanglements produced by conflicting resonances. Those that disalign the event's constitutive components, impelling comprehensive restructuring of overall capacities and liberating newly tractable political potential, corrosive to the cohesiveness of hegemonic networks of influence. It's hyperphonochasmic too, in the way that it severs an event from its resonant effects that reflect and refract through the uncountable prisms of mediatic capture. But Tony, I have to come clean. The unearthing of the score diagram a month before we met must have impelled other temporal displacements as shortly after receiving it, I began noticing small fragments of text within your writings, which I had been incidentally consulting, that uncannily presated some of my ideas 30 to 40 years prior. It felt like I was finding clues that had been deliberately placed there. Actually, I was beginning to think you had invented Adam Gratian, which is why I spoke about it strategically that evening, knowing somehow that you would show up. I'm still not sure, to be honest. And if that wasn't enough, I had just finished writing an exhibition proposal introducing ins uh, involved in the installation of myself at a piano from opening to closing, working out various types of situations, sight readings of notated improvisations being my favorite, when I came across your music in the mind of the world in Joseph's book. Fucking hell. <laughs> Despite this intensely personal co connection with your work, there is much more at stake. Maybe this is what it's like to be a relay. Relays switch things on and off. They also amplify. They bridge gaps, making it possible for small currents to activate larger ones. As relayed ideas gain new valences in the present and are projected into the future as so many messages in a bottle, other elements flicker out of intelligibility. At times, it's as if absent events, unactualized potentials in hearing in any construction continue to exist as part of a parallel history re-emerging unexpectedly, untimely catastrophes. What is ducking out of earshot now, out of my control, those slippages that hold in reserve the power to wreak havoc with modulatory continuity? And by what methods could a received message be ju judiciously bent so as to disturb its natural decay, converting it into an attractor, impelling another revisionist orientation? Stay evil, dear friend. Since Relay X. <laughs> <laughs>